Good morning, church. My name is Claire Mitchell. I serve on staff here and also with our eighth grade girls on Wednesdays. I'm going to be reading today's text, and we're going to begin in Acts chapter 27. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius, and embarking in a ship of Adramidium, which was to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristocrus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. But at soon, a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land, and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow struck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on the planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. This is the word of the Lord. All right, it's my pleasure today to introduce you to uh, David Gibson. He's a member of our church. He's preached here once before, but uh, we're here toward the end of Acts. He gets one of the best chapters, I think. It's one of the most exciting chapters in Acts. So, David, would you come and preach for us? Would you all give him a hand as he comes? It's good to be with you this morning. Um, Thank you, Jason, for giving me an opportunity to share some truth with, with you from God's Word. And so we're um, getting close to the end of our series over the uh, book of Acts, next to the last chapter in chapter 27, where um, we find that uh, the Apostle Paul and his traveling companions are on a um, sea voyage that's gotten kind of western. It's gotten kind of, kind of rough. Things, are, things have turned out bad for, for their trip. And so we find Paul in a predicament that for most of us uh, would be a pretty tough test of our faith. They're on a, they're on a, a journey to Rome, and um, they've encountered a storm, and the boat that they're riding on, the ship that they're counting to get them to Rome is stuck on a sandbar, and it's literally being beat to death by the storm that's going on around it. In fact, it's being torn to pieces. And so we find Paul in a predicament that for most of us would be a pretty tough test of our faith because Paul knows this. Paul knows that God has told him, Paul, you're going to go to Rome. I want you to go to Rome. Rome is your destiny. And all along the way to Rome, Paul has met with one delay after another. One thing after another has stood in the way of Paul getting to the place he, know, he knows that God's called him to go. But now he's on this ship. And this ship is headed for, for Rome. It looks like finally things are starting to turn Paul's way. He's on a ship bound for Rome. Now Paul's still a prisoner. And, but as prisons go, this ship is a pretty good deal um, because the, the, the uh, guards are nice to him. One of them even saves his life at the end we read about. They, they treat him fairly. They treat him kindly. He's getting plenty to eat. He's getting plenty to sleep. For Paul, it's like being on, in prison on a cruise ship. Um, he's, he's kicked back. He's enjoying life. Everything's going Paul's way. He's on his way to Rome, and then wham, all of a sudden, a storm shows up, and everything is wrecked. Nothing is the same ever again. Now, living where we live, we know a thing or two about storms, don't we? And we've experienced how, like Paul, in an instant, things can go from clear and calm to cloudy and chaos. And so uh, it happens like that in the ap atmosphere. It happens like that in our life, doesn't it? That things, sometimes when they're going our way, all of a sudden, wham, a storm blows in, and nothing is easy anymore. Everything's different. Everything's changed. And so... Um, many times when life storms come, it, it, it tests our faith, doesn't it? Sometimes when the storm comes, it makes us look to God and ask why. You ever asked why of God? You ever had something come up in your life that was so out of the blue that you asked God why this? Especially when you know you've been living for Him. 
God, I go to church as often as I can. God, I'll read your Bible every day. I'm paying my tithes. I'm being a good boy. I'm being a good girl. And yet I'm suffering this way. Why, God? Why has this happened? I've served you all my life, so why did I get cancer? I've been trusting in you, believing in you, so why can I not get a job? Lord, I'm doing what your word says, but I still can't pay my bills. Why the storm? I've been doing the best I can. Why the storm? At one time or another, we all go through what I call life storms. And so today, I want to use my time to talk to you about storms. Not, not atmosphere storms, not meteorolo meteorological, I can't hardly say that word, but life storms. Storms that just come into our life and change everything. And maybe when we're done with this message this morning, maybe we'll have a different perspective on our life storm that might make us able to weather the storm with a little bit more faith. And so today, I want to share a few things with you concerning storms. So number one, it might be from the devil. It might be the devil. Sometimes the storms we go through are the devil's efforts to interfere with the good thing that God's up to in our lives. God has a good plan for us because he loves us, but the devil hates us. And so the devil is going to try to do everything he can to stop God's good plan from happening in our lives. And we find um, an example of that in Mark chapter 4. So if you look with me at Mark chapter 4, let's look down about verse 35. Pretty famous storm that we've all heard of. Mark chapter 4 and verse 35, it says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with him, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Imagine that. Jesus is asleep during the storm. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, listen to what he said, peace, be still. And I'm not so sure he was talking to the storm as much as he was talking to them. But he said, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. And so most of us are pretty familiar with this storm because it's a storm where Jesus was asleep in the bottom of the boat. And most messages or lessons that you hear taught or preached about this, focus on why it was that Jesus was sleeping in the boat. The apostles, or the disciples, they were in fear of dying, and yet Jesus was sound asleep on a pillow in the, in the bottom of the boat. And I'm going to give you my opinion on that too, but I think there's a powerful truth to be learned when we look at the origin of this storm. Where did it come from? Why did it blow into their, into their lives in the first place? And so... Uh, we find the answer to that question, the answer to the origin of the story, we find it in the very next chapter, beginning at verse 5, Mark chapter 5, or chapter 5, verse 1. It says, so they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerizines. You might know it better as the Gadarenes. Verse 2 says, when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out of the tomb to meet him. And so Jesus was crossing the sea, because on the other shore was a man possessed by a spirit from the evil one. The devil had him. The devil was in control of this man's life. The devil was making this man's life a living nightmare. But Jesus was on his way to set him free, and the devil knew that. And so the devil put a storm in his way to try and blow him off course. But where was Jesus? In the middle of the devil's storm, where was Jesus? He was sound asleep in the boat. Jesus had a good plan in store for this man. And so um, he, had a, he, he was crossing the sea because he had a good plan. The devil had a bad plan. The, but God had a good plan in store for this man. And Jesus was crossing the ocean to get to him to carry out his good plan. Listen, you might be here this morning and you might be having an issue. You might be going through a life storm. Maybe it's the enemy coming against you. I want you to know this. There's nothing in heaven or on earth or hell itself that can stop Jesus from getting to you with his good plan. Jesus has a plan. God has a plan. And nothing can stop him from carrying out his plan. This man, Jesus had a good plan for this man. But the devil, because, because God loves us, he had a good plan for us. But the devil had another plan. He was trying to stop him. And so he blew through this, this storm in, in Jesus' way to try to throw him off course. Jesus had a good plan in store, in store, so the devil sent a storm to blow him off course. But Jesus was asleep in the bottom of the boat. Can you imagine that? In the middle of a devil storm, Jesus was sound asleep at rest in the boat. Why? 
because Jesus knew something that we need to know, is that the plans of God are no match for the plans of the evil one. I said that backwards. <laughs> the plans of the evil one are no match for the plans of God. Did you know that God has a good plan for you? If you believe God's got a good plan for you, would you raise your hand? Seven of you believe God's got a good plan for you. It's more than that. It's most of you. But God has a good plan for you. I got proof for it. Look what it says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, it says this. This is God speaking. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not disaster to give you future and a hope. And so if God's plans are good because he loves you, then the devil, because he hates you, his plans are bad. If God's plans are to give you, or for not disaster, the devil's plan for you is disaster. And so the truth is that God loves you, and because he, lo he loves you, he has good plans for you, but the devil hates you. And because he hates you, he wants to stop God's good plan from taking shape in your life. And so when he sees you on that path that leads to God's good plan, he's going to try to do anything he can to blow you off course. He may even send a life storm into your life to blow you off course. His hope is to turn you from the narrow path that leads to life onto the wide path that leads to destruction. Jesus said this. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I have come to give you life and to give it more abundantly. But he says there's an evil one, there's an enemy, which is the devil. And he's come, he says, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Maybe you're going through a storm, but maybe it's just the enemy's feeble efforts to try to, um, to steal what God wants to give, to kill what God wants to bring to life, to destroy what God wants to create in your lives. And so what do you do when you think the storm that you're going through is from the devil? First, you take heart and take encouragement in knowing that if the devil's against you, it must be that God's for you, and it must be that on the other side of the storm, something good is waiting. There's a, there's a uh, uh, scripture in the book of Peter where he says, don't be surprised at this fiery trial that's come against you. If when a football player has got the ball and he's headed for his goal, he's not surprised that the other team is trying to stop him. Have you ever seen somebody score a basket on, in basketball on the wrong side of the court? You ever see anybody shoot into the wrong basket? When that's happening, when he's got the ball and he's going the wrong way, does the other team ever try to stop him from scoring? Never. They want him to score. But when he's going the opposite way, when he's going the right way, the enemy, the opponent tries to stop him. Listen, if the devil's against you, take heart because it means you're going the right way. It means you're following what God wants you to follow. You're on the path that leads to, right, to, to life. But when you do that, be aware that he's going to throw a storm in your way to try to blow you off course. He wants you on the, ride, the wide road that leads to destruction. Listen to what it says. And then, and then we need to take to heart what Jesus said in the middle of the devil's storm. When they woke him up, Jesus wiped the sleep out of his eyes, and he said to them, as well as the storm, what did he say? Peace, be still. Look at what Jesus says to us in John chapter 14 and verse 27. John chapter 14 and verse 27. 27, Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus says, peace. I leave my peace with you. Peace in the middle of the storm comes by knowing what Jesus knew, which is that the plans of the evil one are no match for the plans of God. Don't be blown off course by the storms of the devil. And have peace to rest in knowing that the storm that's against you is no match for the Savior that's with you. Amen? He's with you. And nothing on in earth, nothing on in heaven, nothing even from the pits of hell can stop the good plan that God set for you. So sometimes the storm is from the devil, but sometimes it's us. Sometimes our life storm is of our own making. Here's a fact. Every choice and every action has a consequence. Everything you decide to do has a consequence. Everything you decide not to do has a consequence. Everything we do has consequence. For example, fellas, if your wife says this, do these pants make me look fat? <laughs> do not answer that honestly. Answer it wisely. <laughs> Because if you don't answer it wisely, there will be consequence. There's one right answer for that question. And the answer is, no, honey, they make you look beautiful. All right, it's just a tip. 
Keep that in mind. Because, listen, everything that we do, everything that we say, there's consequence. It's just an inescapable fact of life that every decision and every, des- and every action has a consequence. And the Bible's in, in agreement. Look at what it says in Galatians, the book of Galatians, um, down about chapter 6. I think I've got that one still. I'll just read this one. Galatians chapter 6 says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. God says, I'm not going to be mocked. You're not going to plant sunflower seeds and hope to get tomatoes. It just doesn't happen that way. And you're not going to make a lifetime full of bad decisions and hope to get a good life. You're not going to be, um, he says, don't expect to go out there and do whatever you want to and then have a wonderful life. He said, I've put down a guideline for you. I've given you some words to live by. If you live by my words, if you sow to the Spirit, I promise you, you're going to reap life. He says, if you sow to the flesh, I'll promise you this, you're going to reap destruction. Um, He's saying that for every action, there's a reaction. For everything done, there's a consequence. If the action is good, the consequence is good. If the action is bad, the consequence is bad. The Bible teaches us that wise choices tend to reap a harvest of peace, but unwise choices tend to reap a harvest of chaos. This is what the Bible says. It's in agreement with it. I want to show you what it says in Hosea chapter 8 and verse 7. Hosea chapter 8 and verse 7 says this, for they sow the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. What's that mean? It means that whatever we do, we can expect to get it back in return. Whatever we sow, we're going to get back in a harvest. We've all been on the verge of a storm of our own sowing. How many times have we stood with a choice to make and made the wrong choice? We stood with a chance to sow to the Spirit and reap back life, but instead we decided to sow to the, to the flesh and we reap destruction. We had a choice to make. We made the wrong choice. And in the distance, the thunder of consequence began to rumble and the whirlwind began to spin. To spin. Listen, I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to myself. I have made mistakes. I've made unwise choices. I have sinned against God. And because I have, I reap the whirlwind. I suffered through a storm of my own making. But here's what I want you to know. Even though the storm was my fault, God did not abandon me to my storm. Even though it was my fault, I sinned against God. God did not abandon me. God did not leave me to be overwhelmed by my storm. And so if you're here this morning and you think you might be going through a storm that's of your own own making, it's important that you know that Jesus has never abandoned a sinner, not once. The Bible says this about us. He says all of us, everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of, glory of God. There's not a person in this room who hasn't chosen wrongly. There's not a person in this room who can say, this is not my fault. Listen, we're a sinner. It's our fault, but the good news is God does not abandon the sinner. Jesus does not abandon the sinner. He never has, and he never will. Remember the woman at the well? She was there alone in the middle of the day. Why? Because everybody else knew about her sin, and they abandoned her. But Jesus, the Bible says, went out of his way to get to where she was and teach her about grace. Remember the woman that was caught in the act of adultery? Everybody else picked up a stone to condemn her. But Jesus picked up the sinner. He said, where are those that accuse you? And she said, they're gone, Lord. He said, then neither do I condemn you. So the fact is, the Bible makes it clear over and over and over again that God does not abandon us when we sin. Here's what the devil says. The devil says, if you sin, God's through with you. If you choose against God, God will abandon you. But the truth is that Jesus never abandons us. He's not done with us. And just like with that, and remember, what about Adam and Eve? Remember them? <laughs> In the, remember when they sinned? Who was it that came to their rescue? Was it the devil? No. When they followed followed the serpent away from God, the devil abandoned them. He wanted them to die. He wanted them to spend eternity in hell just like he was going to do. But it was God, even though they were sinners, even though they had chosen against him, it was God that came to them and said, where are you? His invitation was come out from where you're hiding. Come to me. Let's deal with what you've done, and let's get back to our right relationship again. 
God does not abandon the sinner. God invites the sinner to come to him so that he can deal with what they've done and restore their right relationship. I want to share a couple of scriptures with you before we leave this. Look at Romans chapter 5, and verse 8. Romans chapter 5 says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, though I'm a terrible sinner, what happened? Christ died for me. He didn't wait for me to get right while I was still a sinner. Christ died for me. Look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But listen to this. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. What's he, what's he saying? The old King James says that where, great, where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. What in the world is, was, does, that, does that mean? Um, that last scripture may even, not only does it tell us that not only does God not abandon us when we sin, but maybe God is never closer to us than when we sin. You ever think about that? That God is closer to the sinners than he is anybody else? I had a, my wife and I are empty nesters now. <laughs> and so instead of enjoying that, you know what we did? We got three puppies. We got three little French bulldog puppies. And uh, where they stay is kind of, uh, kind of hut pile off the ground in the, in the room where they are has a, a kind of a fire escape. And they've got big enough now they can get up and down that fire escape. But it's about 14 steps. It's kind of steep. And the other day, and they, when they go down that thing, that fire escape, they go down it like they are on fire. <laughs> it's just whoosh. And the first two made it down just fine. But the second one, she's a little shorter than the first two, and she tripped about step number six. And she just tumbled head over heels all the way down to the bottom. And she just got down there, and she looked like her little, her little heart was broken. But you know what my wife did who was with them? She let the other two go, and she went to the one that fell, and she picked it up and said, oh, it's okay. She made sure he was okay. She made sure that he wasn't scared anymore and everything's going to be all right. And she let the fallen one know she was close to it and loved it. And it made everything better. She was happy again. She was over her fall. Listen, it was the whole story of the lost sheep. Remember the, the 100 sheep that the guy had? He left 99 to go after the one that had went astray. And he picked it up. He didn't condemn it. He didn't beat it to death. He picked it up and put it on his shoulders, and he lovingly carried it home. That's who our Jesus is. Our Jesus is not someone who abandons the sinner. Our Jesus is someone who picks up the sinner and is close to the sinner. I want to share one more verse with this one before we move on. Look at John chapter 1, verse 16. John 1, 16 says this, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Grace after grace. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Nicaragua for a mission trip, and I was going to have to preach there, and they speak Spanish in Nicaragua. I don't speak Spanish, and so I was going to have to speak through a, preach through an interpreter. And I was kind of concerned about it. I didn't really know what to preach. And one day we went to the beach, uh, the day before I was going to preach, and on the beach, the, the waves were huge that day. It was like those Hawaii 5 uh, waves, you know, and they were just crashing one after the other. And as I stood there and looked at those, those waves, they just never stopped. They just kept pounding the beach and pounding the beach. And God said, tell them that's what it's like with my grace. My grace never stops. Every time you sin, there is a mountain of grace to wash it away. There's a mountain of grace to, to, to cover it. You won't be overwhelmed by your sin because your sin will be overwhelmed by my grace. Isn't our God good? that he never abandons the sinner, but he comes to the sinner and he gives grace to the sinner. I'm so glad that's who our Jesus is. And so sometimes it's the devil, sometimes it's our own fault, but sometimes it's just a storm. Sometimes it's just a storm. One of the oldest questions of the, in the world is why God do good things, do bad things happen to good people? If God loves us, then why did he create a world with cancer? If God loves us, then why do you make a world where tragedies happen? If God loves us, then why do you make a world where people um, hurt and kill each other? People want to blame God for all the bad that's in the world, but the truth is God did not make a, a world with bad things in it. The Bible says that God made a perfect world. At the end of creation, every day, God looked at what he made, and he said this, it is good. It's good. God made a good world. 
And he gave it to us as a home. And he said, listen, you can keep it this way by proving to me that you love me by eating the fruit off of every tree on the planet. You can have it all, just not the one tree in the middle. Leave that one alone. And if you leave that one alone, you'll prove you love me more than you love yourself, and the world will stay perfect. But what did we do? We chose the one thing that God said not to do. We chose that we lo- and we showed we loved ourselves more than him. And when we chose against God, then we invited bad things. And the- we invited death into the world. We invited sickness into the world. We invited bad things into the world. God made a good world, and we invited bad into it. It's a fallen world. The choice that we, that we make, the consequence that we made, was that now we live in a fallen world. Sometimes the life storm might be the devil. Sometimes it might be our own making. But sometimes we suffer through a storm just because we live in a fallen world where bad things happen. We just live in a place where people get sick. We just live in a, in a place where people are mean to each other. We just live in a place where bad things happen even to good, good people. But the, and so we ask, our, we ask ourselves the question, well, if good things, if bad things happen to everybody, if storms come into everybody's life, then what advantage is there to going through life as a Christian? It's very simple. Jesus makes this promise. If you know me, if you accept me, if you trust in me, I promise I'll never leave you to go through your storm alone. And the storm will never overcome you. You'll always overcome the storm. He makes us this promise in Matthew chapter 7. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 7. Now about verse 24. Jesus says this. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, and what he's talking about is someone who's heard his gospel, that Jesus uh, died He was the Son of God. He died on the cross. He was buried in a tomb. He arose the third day. He was carried away into heaven, and one day he's coming back to receive those who trust him. That's the gospel. He says, if you believe it, then you're like a one whose house is built on a rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, who hears that Jesus is the Son of God, who who hears that he did die on the cross, that he did rise from the dead, if they hear that and, and don't believe it and don't accept it, he says, for them, they'll be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Look at what it says in verse 25 again for the other house, that the rain fell, the winds came, it beat on the, the storm beat on that house, but it did not fall. What's he saying? He's saying you're either going to go through life as a Christian or you're going to go through life as a lost person. You're either going to go through life knowing me or rejecting me, and it's better to, and, and both of you are going to have a storm. Notice the storm came to both houses, but one stood. Which one stood? The one founded on the rock. The rock is Jesus. And if you'll found your life on him, if you'll build your life on him and his gospel, though the storms are going to come. It's a fallen world. Storms are going to come. You're going to have to go through some bad things. But the promise of Jesus is this. You will make it through. I'll be there with you. I won't let the storm have you because I've got you. So sometimes it's the devil. Sometimes it's us. Sometimes it's just a storm, and then sometimes it's not really a storm. Number four, sometimes it's not really a storm after all. So I'm going to share with you a a piece of the uh, Scripture from Mark chapter 6 and John chapter 6, and it's a story that you know very well. In both uh, books, Mark chapter 6 and John chapter 6, we read about where Jesus fed the multitude. Remember, he took the five loaves and the two fish, he blessed it, gave it to his disciples, and fed 5,000 men plus their wives and their, and their children. And then after uh, he did that in both accounts, he told his disciples to get into a boat and to go across the ocean. And that's where we kind of pick up the story. Let's look at Mark chapter 6 at verse, verse 47. And I got a little clippy on my Bible because I'm going to go back and forth between John and Mark. Look at Mark chapter 6. At verse uh, 45, Mark chapter 6, verse 45. Immediately, that means immediately after the miracle was done, he made his disciples get into a boat 
and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was on the sea, and he was alone on the land. All right, so here's what happened. The miracle of the, of the 5,000 feeding the multitude was over. He tells his disciples to get into a boat and go to Bethsaida. They get into the boat, and then what happens? Tell me. Storm. Everybody says that. Everybody says a storm came up. But look at what it says in verse 48. And he saw that they were making headway painfully. Why? The wind was against them. That's all. We perceive it. We thought it was a storm, didn't we? The disciples thought it was a storm. It seemed like a storm, but all it was was a, a wind that was blowing against them. They were going one way, and the wind was going another. You ever rode against the wind? You ever walked uphill? <laughs> it's much easier to walk downhill than uphill, right? They were just walking uphill. They were rowing against the wind. It wasn't a storm. It was just a wind that was blowing against their line of travel. Why? Why do we assume that the apostles perceived the storm, that it, the wind that it came as a storm? The answer comes when we look at um, Mark's account and John's account together. Again, look at Mark chapter 6, verse 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side to where? Bethsaida. Now look at John chapter 6 and verse 16. Same story. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. Jesus said, get in the boat and go to Bethsaida, but instead they went to Capernaum. Why? Why did they do that? Why did they disobey Jesus? Why did they go to a different place than he said? Jesus, and the, and the reason is this, they were upset about the miracle of feeding the 5,000. They had a bad attitude towards it. See, these men had just gotten off of a very extensive missionary journey, and they and it lasted for months, and they were exhausted. And Jesus' promise to them, as soon as they got off that missionary trip, that mission trip, he said, it's time to rest. I'm going to give you a, a chance to rest. He made that promise in Mark chapter 6 at verse 30. I'm going to show it to you. Mark chapter 6, verse 30. It says, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure, couldn't even sit down to eat. So they went away into a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now, many, now this place where the miracle happened was a place they were supposed to be resting, recuperating from their work. Now many saw them, verse 33, many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And so Jesus promised a time of rest. When they got there, there was a multitude, and they had to serve them. And they had a bad attitude. Jesus promised me rest. Now i got to work. So they spent the next how many hours passing out fish and chips to a bunch of people at a revival. And they didn't like it. Their hearts were hard about it. Um, Look what it says in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 51 and 52. It's at the end of the storm, we get kind of the idea of what their attitude was. When it says this, Then he climbed into the boat, being Jesus, and the wind stopped. They were, they were totally amazed. Verse 42, For they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Look at this. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. They were mad at Jesus because they were tired. Jesus had promised some rest, and here they were having to work as a team of waiters. And now, after all that, they still weren't getting what Jesus promised. He said, get in the boat and go to Bethsaida. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. Why? Bethsaida was a rough town. Bethsaida was a fisherman's town. It was a place full of poor people. It was a place full of needy people. They'd spent months ministering to people just like that. Jesus said, now it's time to rest, and here they are having to go to another place to do missionary work. And they said, we're not going there. Instead of going to Bethsaida, they said, let's go to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is a different story altogether. Capernaum is the Cancun of the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> Capernaum is a resort town. Capernaum is in, in in, uh, Beth, in Bethsaida, in, in Capernaum, instead of um, waiting on other people, other people wait on you. 
in Capernaum, instead of making other people happy, people work to make you happy. And the disciples said, let's go there. Let's go to Cancun. Let's go to Capernaum. Let's go to the place. Since Jesus won't give us the rest, he promised we're going to go and get it for ourselves. We're going to get the rest, rest we deserve for ourselves. Now, Bethsaida and Capernaum are 180 degrees apart from each other. Uh, they're totally opposite in direction of each other. So if the wind was against them going to, Beth, to Capernaum, it stands to reason that had they been going to Capernaum, it would have been behind them. See the difference? It wasn't a storm at all. It was just them going against the wind God had given to them. See, here's what Jesus' plan was. After the feeding of the multitude, how many baskets of food was left over? Twelve, one for each. Here was Jesus' plan. Here was his promise. They're going to get on a boat. They're going to be able to put away their rows because Jesus said, I've ordained a wind to blow them gently along to the place I want them to go. They're going to get the rest, I promise. They're going to get their own basket of fish and chips. Things are going to be great. But instead of having a cruise ship to the next destination and getting the rest Jesus promised, instead of that, they were going against Jesus. They were going against the direction he gave, and look how they spent their night. Look at Mark chapter 6, verse 48. He saw, Jesus saw, that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. They weren't in a storm. They were just going opposite of God's wind. They were going opposite of God's will. And listen, you might be here this morning, and you might be thinking, I'm going through a storm. And you've been calling out to God, God, calm this storm. You said you'd calm the storm, but maybe it's not really a storm. Maybe it's time to take stock and say, maybe I'm just not following God's, maybe I'm outside God's will. And maybe this storm that I'm feeling, maybe it's just me going the wrong way. If you think that's you, if you think you might be going the wrong way today, what do you need to do? Repent. Just turn around. Just go the other way. Are you tired of struggling and getting nowhere? The Bible says this, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that's destruction. But acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Do you feel like you've been struggling, getting nowhere? And the invitation today is to ask God, Lord, am I just going the wrong way? Do I just need to turn around? Am I going against you? And the fact is that as you're sitting there, if that's you, the Holy Spirit is tapping you hard on the shoulder right now saying, it's you. He's talking about you. You know this is not a devil storm. You know it's not a, uh, it's not, uh, a storm of your own making. It's just the fact that you're not doing what I ask. You're rowing against me. Repent and let's do this thing together. You'll be amazed at how much better it is going with God than against God. So sometimes it's the devil. Sometimes it's us, sometimes it's just a storm, and then sometimes it's not a storm at all, and then five, sometimes there's damage. <laughs> sometimes there's damage. The fact is, living where we live, we know a thing or two about storms, don't we? And we know that, we know this about storms that when they blow through, they almost always leave some damage behind. Sometimes it's minor. Sometimes it's just a few limbs that are broken off. Sometimes maybe just our car gets a hell dent or two in it. And, but sometimes it's more severe. Sometimes an entire house gets blown away. Sometimes people get injured. Sometimes people even die. But the fact about storms is they almost always leave behind some damage. And so we have to decide what to do with it. And this storm we read about in Acts chapter 27, was, a, was a, the storm that we read about there, was a storm that left behind a lot of damage. In fact, everything was damaged. The Bible says that the ship came totally apart. There was nothing left of it. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Paul to be on that ship that he was counting on getting him to, Ro to Rome? His thinking was, this ship's going to carry me all the way to Rome. And then all of a sudden, the storm hits, and everything starts falling apart around him. Can you imagine what it must have felt like? I bet it was a sinking feeling. The first, first service didn't like it any better. I said I wasn't going to tell it, told it, still not funny. But it must have been a terrible feeling. But maybe you're here today, and you don't have to wonder what Paul felt like. Because you've gone through a storm too, and like Paul and the crew, you've done everything you could to hold it together. That's, they were counting on that, that ship to get them to Rome. 
they had done everything they could to keep it afloat and keep it together. The Bible says they threw everything overboard to try and keep the thing floating. It said they took heavy cords of rope and they wrapped the hole with it, trying to hold it together, but still everything was coming apart. And maybe you know what that's like. You've done everything you can to hold things, to keep things afloat. You've done everything you can to hold things together, and still it's coming apart around you. You just can't stop it. You've tried everything, and everything's falling apart. The business, might, but here's what God wants you to know. He wants you to know the truth that he told Paul. He's given you the same promise that he gave Paul. Paul counted on, he was counting on this ship to get him to Rome. And God came and said to Paul, he said, listen, Paul, the, the ship might not make it to Rome. The ship might not survive the storm, but you will. And here's what God wants you to know. That thing that you thought you'd have all your life, it might not make it, but you will. The business might go under, but you won't. The relationship might fail, but you won't. The dream you had might not survive the storm, but God's promise is that you will survive the storm if you'll stick with him. Jeremiah, Isaiah chapter 43 says this. Isaiah 43, verse 1 and 2. Here's what he says. He says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have, I have called you by name, you're mine. Listen to verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. You might have had something that you think, this is going to be with me, I'm going to have this, I can depend on this to the very end. But it's coming apart. And you're trying to hold it together, you're trying to keep it afloat. Listen, it might not make it. That thing might not make it, but God's promise is you will make it. If you'll stick with me, you're going to make it. Take that promise to heart this morning. There might be damage, but you'll make it because God, because God will walk with you. Your God will walk through your damage with you. When the storm was over, Paul had nothing left but deep water and broken pieces of the ship. The ship was completely broken to pieces. There was not one piece of it left together. The Bible says there was nothing left but broken pieces. And so what did they do with the damage that was left behind? Because what they did with the damage is a good lesson to what we ought to do with the damage that's left behind in our lives. When that thing you thought you'd have forever, when it falls apart and nothing is left but damage, what do you do? You need to do probably what Paul did. Some of them were able to swim. And they said, you guys that can swim, take off. Paul wasn't a swimmer. The rest of them weren't swimmers. And so here's what they did. Look at Acts chapter 27, verse 44. It says, the rest, some on boards and some on what? Broken pieces. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to the land. They made it, but they made it on broken pieces. What do you do with the damage? You find the things that are important. You hold on to them and you start kicking for sure. You don't give up. You don't stay there and drown. You grab the broken pieces of what used to be, and you head towards what God says is going to be next. And I'll end with a little, I'll close with a little story of how this came to be in my life. When I first was called into the ministry, I was pastoring a church, been pastoring it for several years, and at the time, I was in a marriage I thought would last forever. It didn't. It crashed and burned for a lot of different reasons. Some of, them were my, some of it was my fault, but it fell apart. I thought I would have that. For, I thought I would ride that marriage to the end. I tried to hold it together. We tried to keep it afloat, but it just, it just broke, and there was nothing left but damage. And I could either sink and be done with, or I could grab onto something that was important and keep on going. And so what I had... I found one very important piece that was left. I had a little three-year-old boy. And I grabbed a hold of him and I said, listen, you're important. No matter what has happened, we're going to make it. And I started, and I grabbed a hold of him. He was my broken piece. And we started kicking towards the shore. And on the way, I came across a pretty lady. <laughs> and 
and she had grabbed onto the same kind of piece. She had a little boy of her own, and she was doing her best to get to shore. And so we just decided to get together, and we started kicking to shore for, for together, and we've been doing it for almost three decades. <laughs> and that little boy that I was holding on to, he's got a family of his own, and his children call that pretty lady Mimi. And her little boy, he's got a family of his own, and his children call me Papa. <laughs> Listen, there's always going to be damage. The thing you thought might get you to the end, it might not, but you will make it. It might not make it, but by the grace of God, you will. God doesn't abandon you. God doesn't leave you to the storm. God is for you. He's with you. There's going to be damage, but by the grace of God, you will make it. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much. God, for the truth of your word, that God, it's true that we just live in a fallen world, that we live in a place where bad things happen. God, sometimes we mess up, sometimes we sin, and sometimes we reap the consequences of that sin. But God, we thank you that you're a God who never abandons the sinner, that your grace is abundant. Though our sin is, is many, your grace is much more. That God... Your grace is there to overpower our sin time after time after time. And there may be someone who's here today, and they've realized that they're suffering through a storm of their own making. Let them know that today there is grace available to rescue them from that storm. Their sin is not the end of them because your grace is there to carry them on. And maybe there's some here today who are dealing with the damage of a broken thing. God, help them to see that today they can grab the pieces of that of what was and they can start with you kicking towards a new life that is going to be better than they ever could have imagined. We thank you for your good plan. We thank you that nothing, not even the enemy, can come against your good plan. We thank you that the plans of God are greater than the plans of the enemy. God, we give you this time of invitation. Do with it what you will. Call us. God, help us to be obedient to your call. It's in Jesus' name we pray.